where they will discuss the end of the most successful individual tenure any coach has ever had with any NFL team. And Mike Reese, before we went to break, and, and Damian Woody in the break confirmed this for me, the legendary stories I would hear about how Belichick might be walking down the hallway and, and one of the players on special teams might walk by him and Belichick would just stop him cold and just start quizzing him about assignments for that week's games. That, that is sort of the stuff. I see the smile on Lewis Riddick's face. That's the stuff of legend, Mike, in that building. It is, and it, and it also speaks to Bill Belichick. Think about his background. His dad was a longtime scout and coach. His mom was a teacher. And I always felt like Greeny Belichick is a teacher at heart, and he loved these pop quizzes. And players would talk about it, whether they were walking in the hallway or whether it was the team meeting. He would be the whole team in front of him, and he might single out a player and say, hey, if this team loses their long snapper, Who's the backup long snapper? And a player would be looking around saying, oh, boy, is he looking, yep. is he looking at me? And then they'd be yep. checking their ESPN app or their Google, <laughs> yeah. hoping they get the answer. So he's always trying to keep everyone hey, on edge. Hey, Mike, Mike, hey, let me, Mike, let me tell you something. I used to have our binder with our personnel right by my foot in those team meetings, and it opened up just in case because Bill, it, 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 he wouldn't discriminate <laughs> about who he would point. Like, he, like, it didn't matter. He would point to any guy to make sure that everybody knew, mm -hmm. not only personnel, but as far as, like, statistics or anything. Like, he wouldn't hesitate to really jump on a player in, in those instances. He was... He was the master at that. Mm. And, and, you know, Lewis, there's been a lot of discussion this week in particular about that personality style. Dan and I have been, Dan Orlovsky and I have been talking during the break a little bit about how we've seen so many of his former assistants go other places and not have the kind of success that he's had. It's not easy to make those kinds of connections with players necessarily. You have to have the right group. As we live now in the world in 2023, that is so different yeah. than when you played for him in 1994. Do you think that that is a, 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 a brand of coaching that perhaps has seen its last days with Belichick going out today? Yeah, I think there's a good chance of it, Greeny, for sure. I, I don't think you can communicate with players now the same way you could communicate with players in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s. I don't think you can build teams now the same way you could build teams in the early 90s and 2000s. I mean, I know for sure Nick Saban had to change his recruiting style when he first got to Bama, you know, when he first left. Well, let's just say when he first left, left Cleveland, went to Michigan State, then went to LSU, and then went to Bama, he had to change his style then from then to now. It has to be now about the individual. Like right now, pl recruits, players want to hear about how are you good for me? Not what can your program do. And I mean, not what... I can do for your program, but what can your program do for me? And then in the end, hopefully you're picking enough of the right people that then you can wind up building a team on the back end of it. It's almost like flipped on its head. And so what they used to do now, what they used to be able to do back in the 90s, the way Bill used to be able to coach us back in the 90s, probably doesn't go over very well now. And quite honestly, you know, I think that's a little bit something that really, for me, has robbed the game of maybe some of its consistency because I just don't know if players are held to the same kind of standard or if there's the same kind of accountability uh, that is enforced the same way it was back then. Back then, look, I mean, Woody's sitting here talking about, you know, we all could talk about these stories. I'll, I'll just give you a story about how it was never good enough for Bill. It was never good enough for Nick. And I've told this story to you guys before. In 1994, that season we had in Cleveland where we went to the playoffs and we played the Patriots and then played the Steelers in the, in the playoff game. In the, in the wild card game, I wind up starting that game, have about 10 tackles and interception, and I'm thinking I'm going to win the player of the game when you go into the team meeting the next day on Monday. And when I stand up, when Bill's about to announce the defensive player of the game and he tosses a ball to you in the, in the, in the auditorium, he tosses it to my, to my buddy at safety, Eric Turner. And I'm sitting, I'm crushed. I'm sitting there going, you know, like, damn, what do I have to do to win a game ball? Eric Turner gives me the game ball and says, no, Lewis deserves this game ball. And Bill kind of looks at him and he looks back at me and he goes, okay, fine. Lewis, you got it. And, you know, and just like that. So, and then the meeting's breaking up. I'm walking down the steps to walk out of the meeting room and he grabs me by the arm and he looks me dead in the eyes and goes, it doesn't matter. What are you going to do next week? That's mm. it. 
That's all he said, and he turned and walked away. So you knew, like, it was always about, hey, look, he did not rest on his laurels. He didn't care about what happened in the past. It was always about, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do to raise the standard? And I just don't know if people want to be held to that level of accountability anymore. I don't know if people are willing to, like, deal with that kind of in-your-face, bottom-line, production-oriented type of process. Because it was hardcore then. I had many sleepless nights in Cleveland in the, during the week from mistakes you make during practice. You were scared <laughs> to come in the team meeting the next day off a mistake you made in practice, let alone <laughs> the games. And see, that level of, account of accountability, I don't know if people can handle that now, but that's how it was then, and that's what launched this dynastic run that both of these guys went on because it never changed, man. It never – that's how you win six Super Bowls, seven national titles, playing nine Super Bowls. People want greatness, but they aren't willing to make the sacrifices in order to achieve it. These two were willing to make whatever sacrifice was necessary. And if you weren't willing to make it, you were gone. You were absolutely gone. And you know what? In hindsight, I wouldn't have it any other way. I would not have mm. wanted to play for any other coaches. I could, if I could have been with those two my entire career, and I mean my entire career, I would have done it. I would have chosen it, although at the time it felt like absolute torture. <laughs> so, so, Lewis, I, 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 want, I want you to touch a, a, a touch a bit on, you know, back in the 90s, how you guys were able to strategize and do things that a lot of people think are very creative now in the, in the, in the 2000s from a defensive perspective. Yeah. You know, see, a lot of people think that football started being played once, you know, the Internet hit. People that football started being played <laughs> once Twitter came into existence. There was a lot of football that was being played at a very high level long, long before that. As the breaking news this morning from Foxborough, it is as significant news as we could get in the National Football League, and that is that Bill Belichick and the Patriots are parting ways after 24 seasons together, an unprecedented success for any coach at any franchise in the entire history of the National Football League. Six Super Bowl championships, Belichick currently 15 wins shy of breaking Don Shula's NFL record of 347 as a head coach. Belichick, along with the owner, Robert Kraft, will hold a news conference together today at noon Eastern time. We will broadcast that news conference live here on ESPN, so you will hear from both of these men. And again, in addition to Damian Woody, I have Teddy Bruschi standing by, and I have Adam Schefter standing by. We'll have Marcus Spears as we continue a little bit as well here. But, Shefty, I will start with you, you and Mike Reese, with the reporting on this story this morning. Well, for those uh, who are just joining us here at the top of this hour, I give you the floor. What's everything they need to know about this decision and the end of this era? Greeny, it's a new era in New England. There will be a noon press conference today in which, in which both Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick both will attend that press conference. Let's look first back at what happened and transpired this week briefly. The two men, Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick, met throughout the day on Monday. Bill Belichick did not go into the offices on Tuesday, and those meetings resumed on Wednesday. I was told that they were non-contentious. It was not very difficult to get through, and both sides were content and comfortable going their own direction. Thus, the breakup. Thus, each side mutually parting ways here with the Patriots now embarking on their first head coaching search with an entirely different set of rules in the National Football League from the last time they did this since 2000. Long time, quarter of a century since they did their last head coaching search. Bill Belichick becomes a coaching free agent. He does want to continue coaching and obviously will attempt to do that elsewhere. There are seven other head coaching vacancies across the National Football League, eight in total, including New England. And so there are a lot of teams sifting through a lot of different options. You did the math there, Greeny, this morning, eight of 32. 25% of the National Football League teams right now do not have a head coach, and that's going into this weekend's playoffs. What's next for New England? The search is expected to center on their linebackers coach, Gerard Mayo, who is a, if not the, leading candidate to become the successor to Bill Belichick in New England. Bill goes out there on the open market. You would think there would be many teams that would have some level of interest in speaking with him. A place that would seem to make some sense would be Atlanta with the Falcons. The Falcons owner, Arthur Blank, 
has been a big swinging coach hunter in the past. He essentially went after and didn't get Joe Gibbs. He went after and didn't get Bill Parcells. He now would have the opportunity if he wanted to go after Bill Parcells' disciple. And there you see the eight vacancies in a time where coaching news has rocked the sports world. It started yesterday with the departure of Pete Carroll as the Seattle Seahawks head coach. It continued on when Bill Belichick's good friend Nick Saban retired from Alabama, and it culminated this morning with Bill Belichick and the Patriots agreeing to go their own ways. Nick Saban, during his time at Alabama, nine SEC titles, six national championships. Bill Belichick in New England, nine Super Bowl appearances, six Super Bowl titles. So there's a certain sense of symmetry. You, things sometimes happen in threes. In this particular case, three coaching legends have exited stage left within 24 <laughs> hours of each other. Absolutely. Now, that, that's exactly the right way to say it. Uh, it is the end of an era uh, of a variety of eras in so many different ways. And with Belichick and Saban, there are so many ties of the two of them, including the time they spent together in Cleveland. And Lewis Riddick talked about that earlier. So, Teddy, um, for those who are just joining us in this audience here, um, you played for him for so long. I feel like you know him about as well as any of his former players did. We, many of us, including you, knew this was probably coming. But it still hits a little different when you actually hear it. What are your thoughts this morning? Yeah, I think the moving forward, it's it, it's going to be shocking for a lot of the fans in New England that such a stabilizing force in terms of how he dealt with everything, with the, the structure, the formula, how he dealt with the media. You you almost knew how he was going to react to certain situations or certain questions that he was asked. So it'll take some getting used to because the best that's ever been is now walking out the building and. Talking about that press conference and what they're going to have, I'm glad it's a joint press conference, like Shefty said, but it's going to be a lot of respect. It's going to be a lot of love. It's going to be a lot of admiration. I hope all of New England watches, watches that, and as they do, they realize the greatness that's walking out the door because all of the championships, all of the winning seasons, I mean, it'll never be duplicated again. This is the greatest coach to ever live in terms of winning winning over and over again the sustained success that he was able to maintain is will never be matched um so i hope that bill during this press conference do so, does something that he has never been able to do in his entire life and that sort of reflect on um his past 24 years in new england because he's always answering questions if you will about the next opponent or the next game but now there is none uh, his time is in, in New England is over. He always tells the coaches and the players, do your job, do your job. Well, Bill Belichick's job is done now, and he did it better than anyone in the history of the National Football League. And hopefully he can, he can talk to it as if it is over and reflect and appreciate everything he's done for that organization, those fans, and a lot of players, including myself.